Good evening. We are in Matthew chapter 11 tonight. So if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. This is the last of our series on the Gospels. After this, we'll be moving into the um, major prophets of the Old Testament. I'm leaning towards uh, Isaiah, but I have also been thinking about Ezekiel, and as Pastor Bob, you know, was speaking out of Ezekiel, I'm kind of leaning that way even a little bit more. But, you know, as we've been going through the Gospels, we've kind of taken a little bit of a theme. We believe absolutely Scripture has one interpretation, the message God was wanting to reveal. But we believe Scripture also has many applications. And it would be impossible for us to exhaust all the applications from Scripture that we can glean. So we've kind of taken themes as we've gone through the Gospels. Mark, we really looked at faith. And also this connection between faith and healing. As we know, biblically speaking, faith and healing are related. They are connected. When we did John, we looked at the abundant life that Jesus Christ promised the believer. Luke, we looked at Luke as a personal letter, a personal letter to us individually, and focused on that relationship we have with Jesus and our Father in heaven. As we've been going through Matthew, I have to be honest, I did not know what going into this, what would be our theme for this. But as Matthew, as we've been going through Matthew, it's really lent us to this theme of discipleship. Discipleship, we believe, is different. It is different than salvation in the aspect that salvation is a free gift, but discipleship costs us everything. But does it really cost us everything? I think a part of discipleship is realizing that what we are giving up is what we really didn't have to begin with. Being a disciple is realizing I really don't have anything that I'm giving up. I'm giving up all of my nothing. I'm giving up all of my garbage that I want to hold on to so tightly. As we looked at the Beatitudes, let's be honest. The Beatitudes, when Jesus was preaching this message, he really was giving the common experience of man. Because he talked about poverty and sadness and humiliation and hunger and persecution. And what do we see if we open our history books? What do we see when we look at the experience of man today throughout all the world? We see poverty. We see sadness and depression. We see people humiliated. We see hunger. And we see persecution. The Sermon on the Mount was this beginning sermon he spoke to those disciples that he called. And although he was speaking of this common experience of man, he was giving them hope because that's really what it comes down to. It's a message of hope. We have hope of poverty for the riches of heaven as a disciple. For sadness, we have comfort. Humility, we have inheritance. For hunger, satisfaction. Mercy for mercy, purity to see God, and persecution for a kingdom. When we studied last week in chapter 10, the, dis the sending out of the disciples, because as a disciple and in discipleship, we are the sent out ones. We are being sent out. And we're being sent out to preach the good news. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, 
Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news to the whole creation. When we get to Matthew 28, he'll say, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Luke briefly touched on this in Luke 24, 47, that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And John just said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We call these the Great Commission, to preach the gospel, to make disciples. And we as the church have to be laser focused, laser focused on this Great Commission, on this mission that we have been sent out to proclaim the good news to the unsaved. Too many times there's too much preaching on the bad news to the unsaved. It's after people have placed their faith in Jesus Christ that we make disciples. And this is accomplished by teaching. Now throughout the rest of the epistles, we do see the secondary missions of the church, like caring for the poor, the sick, the hungry, but these are secondary missions. And if these become the primary mission of the church, we have left our first love to spread the gospel of truth, the good news to the unsaved. With this as a preference, let's enter into Matthew chapter 11. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the laws prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is, a, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like, a, like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. I want us to refer back what we studied in chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus said, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. 
Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my, na for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. John was imprisoned for political reasons, you might say. We are blessed to live in America today, but we cannot blur the lines of our duties as citizens of our country and citizens of heaven. Being a Republican or Democrat does not make you a Christian. Neither one of these political parties are the quote unquote Christian party. Ultimately, we know political pressure will be applied to those that preach the gospel. This is the end of all politics. This is what is prophesied in scripture, that all political entities will put pressure on those that spread the gospel. And this will be like the synagogue. Synagogue merely means an assembly that we see that Jesus said we'd be dragged in front of. Those religious organizations We may call this the organized church today. There will be pressure upon those that preach the good news from the organized church even. And there will also to come be pressure from the government, no matter if you live in America, if you live in Brazil, in Russia, anywhere else throughout the world. There will be political pressure on those that preach the gospel. This is the experience of much of the world throughout history. And it will be the experience of America at some point. But let's not think that imprisonment for anything other than preaching the good news is what is applied here in Matthew 10, 19, where he says, they will deliver you over. Do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. Today in America, we do see much, much pressure upon those that preach morality to the unsaved. I refer to this often as preaching the bad news. Because many times there are churches and pastors that will preach against homosexuality. Yet it does nobody that is a homosexual any good to give up their homosexuality and still reject Jesus Christ. And even in them there is not even the ability, no more than it is, for a leper to change his spots, to change himself. This is why we preach the good news. Pastor Bob Beeman, whose picture we have back there, he says that we're fishers of men and it's a situation where we catch and the Lord cleans. So let's preach the good news. As in Matthew eleven four, 4, Jesus answered, Go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Those that cannot see the glorious gospel, they will see the light. The lame walk. Those who have no ability in themselves to do anything, God will empower. Lepers will be cleansed. Leprosy was that which kept you from serving God in the Old Testament. It was, you were deemed unclean or common, not holy. We are made holy in Jesus Christ. The deaf hear those that cannot hear or understand the word of God, their ears will be open and the dead are raised. 
those dead in their trespasses and sins are quickened by the Holy Spirit and are raised up. And the poor have the good news preached to them. It does not matter whether you have a lot of money or if you have nothing. If you reject Jesus Christ, you still die and go to hell. Verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And Capernaum. And you, Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? Will you be brought down to Hades? For if mighty works had been done in you that had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Absolutely, the rejection of Jesus Christ is the impartable sin. Sodom was not destroyed because of their sexuality. Their sexuality was purely a symptom of the sin in their heart. The sin of Sodom that condemned them was the rejection of God. And Peter brings this out in 2 Peter 2.6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example for what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented. It was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly from trials, or rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority, despising God's authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas the angels, though greater and mightier in power, do not pronounce blasphemous judgments against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters which they are ignorant, will also destroy it in their destruction. It was their blaspheming of God. It was their rejection of God that condemned Sodom. They lived like irrational animals because this was in their heart and it acted out to their outer beings. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revelation to little children. Yes, Father, for so much was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses, chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. All the things that we've read about so far, about discipleship, they don't sound very easy, or they don't sound very light. It doesn't sound very restful. And yet Jesus is saying, come unto me. I'll give you rest. 
Yoke up with me. But labored and heavy laden, just like the Beatitudes, is the common experience of man. It is what everybody throughout all nations, all people, we are all burdened and heavy laden. Life's hard. And if you try it on your own, it will be impossible. The statement from Jesus is not that life becomes easy just because you become a believer. The gospel is not a self-help system to make life easy or more manageable. But it is of hope. Hope that we do not have to face this hard life alone. The life that we plow through will be the same whether you're a believer or not. You are given your 80, 90, 100 years. The difference is whether you try to plow this road, this life alone, or you can make the choice to plow it yoked to Jesus. That's the difference. And when you're yoked with Jesus, and you're tired, and feel like you can't pull, he's still pulling because he is not tired. When the load is heavy, and you don't feel that you can carry it, he can still carry it and pull it beside you. And when you absolutely cannot do any more, he still does. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Please apply these things to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.